Hi, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. And Bonnie, thank you for the opportunity to share some of what we've been working on um, with the group here today. My name is Linda Bosma, and I work as an evaluation consultant. I come out of a background of public health and community mobilization. And um, in past years, um, did uh, research and directed research components of the community component of a lot of alcohol policy research projects. And one of the things that led me into evaluation was the interest in how, as we are doing research, we're trying to help people at the community level figure out how to implement and enact that research and use it. And um, how, does, how does that research get translated into practice? And so with my colleagues, who I'd like to acknowledge, Norman Giesbrecht and Emmeline Riesdorfer, who are both um, out of uh, Canada, the Center for Addiction and Mental Health in Toronto, um, we decided that we would take a look at some of the implementation issues for alcohol policy initiatives and see what we could learn um, at, at, is happening. So we are aware that there is a very substantial body of research on what's effective for population-based strategies. So looking at things that can change the environment and impact us population-wide to make changes and to create an environment that's more conducive to preventing alcohol use, reducing the harms related to alcohol use. Um, but we're not as aware how that's actually getting implemented. So there's a lot of good research, but we're not always seeing what's happening to that research when it goes into practice. So our aim was to look at what we could learn about that process, see if we could start to figure out what some of the challenges are. So we did a narrative review, and um, we had 25 search terms from various alcohol policy and um, program types of uh, search words, as well as using the names of 25 scholars that are well known in the alcohol policy field. Um, from that, we got 1,400 hits. Uh, we selected 168 abstracts that were relevant. Out of those, we examined 116 full papers. And the first thing we did was we looked at just the types of policy areas that those papers addressed. And so you can see there was a variety of things. Pricing and taxation was the most uh, frequently uh, examined or written about um, topic, um, which is probably a good thing because pricing and taxation impacting the price and making it more expensive to purchase alcohol, just as with tobacco, is seen as one of the most impactful ways to reduce overconsumption and related problems. Uh, physical availability, how it's sold and purchased and available, um, then things, everything from marketing um, down to having um, a comprehensive alcohol control strategies in your community. So those were some of the types of policies that were looked at. And then from those we pulled out, uh, we looked at areas of challenge. And 58% of the papers that we looked at identified a challenge or addressed challenges, mentioned challenges at all. And from those we, we, um, we group them into eight different categories. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those eight types of challenges. Um, so the first was actual problems with the intervention. And so this might be not, not doing a sufficient dose, maybe only implementing part of it. You read about a program, um, you like this part, you're not so crazy about that part, or maybe this part that talks about changing a policy might be controversial in my community. Um, so a little picking and choosing or not really understanding the implements of fidelity to the original, um, or it may be out of step with what you really need locally. Um, maybe you pick something to implement that's kind of easy, but, but really, um, like for instance, maybe you do keg registration, but what would really help is having some more control over the hours and, and times of sale at local bars, for example. So another issue that we found a uh, challenge was confounding factors. Um, one thing that may happen is funding at the community level to actually implement programs often is depending on grant cycles or approval from public sector budgets. And though the length of that funding and support and resources may not match the length of time it actually takes to do the program. Um, so the program may be in place and you may not have time to finish it. If you have a few staffing hiccups in the, during the implementation phase and lose some time, you may run out of prior to do the program. Um, there aren't a lot of funding sources that guarantee funding for nice blocks of time like five to ten years. So, um, so that can be a challenge. 
Um, sometimes we find that people that are trying to do community work and, and profess to want to address alcohol problems may have some conflicts of interest with alcohol industry funding or support. Um, serving wine at fundraisers for breast cancer, for instance, has become controversial because wine consumption is a huge risk factor for breast cancer. Um, so when you see some groups tying those two together, um, that can be problematic. And then how, how strong are you going to be able to take on the wine industry in a certain policy or practice if they're also funding your prevention work, for example? So these can complicate doing the work at the local level. The other thing that happens very frequently is there are so many problems and so, many t so little time and so few people to do it. So if you're trying to focus on alcohol issues, you might also in your organization or your community be dealing with violence, other types of issues, opioids. Often it's hard for groups to work on more than one issue at the same time. Our research is very often siloed as well. So sometimes it's hard to prioritize enough time for any of those individual things and alcohol um, being um, having the same issue. And then we also see that the alcohol industry will fund research, think tanks, um, sometimes uh, we had a recent instance of a huge amount of alcohol industry funding being put into the National Institutes of Health to fund a project to look for health impacts. Researchers in the alcohol field were able to get that quashed, but $64 million was um, put up by the alcohol industry. Um, not a good thing. Implementation and enforcement, um, oftentimes, People get to the point where, well, we're going to implement this policy, we pass this policy, and they may not think about what does it take to actually implement the policy. Do you have the stakeholders at the table that would actually be necessary to do the, like if you're working on something that has to do with how alcohol is sold, is there somebody in licensing, is there somebody in law enforcement that is on board to help figure out how that implementation is going to happen, um, or do they find out about it after the fact? Um, so oftentimes our grant goes right up to implementation and not after. Another challenge that we saw was public and policymaker preferences. Um, and there's an expression that policies that are ineffective are popular and those that are effective are not popular. And that can be a challenge. Doing what's, what may work may also be harder and more controversial and require more change in the community. Maybe more self-examination about how we treat alcohol as a substance. Um, community practitioners have been shown at times to pick project, pick if they're given a choice of things to implement, um, have been shown to choose things that are less effective, that may be more popular or feel more friendly. So that can be a challenge. And then in the decision-making process, often public health people are, public health interests are not well represented at the decision-making table. There may be moneyed interests or other stakeholders in the community. And sometimes people look at the short-term um, costs. Perhaps um, you may hear a merchant saying, well, this might affect my ability to, you know, I need to train my employees on how to prevent illegal sales. That's a cost to me. And looking at that short-term cost sometimes outweighs looking at the long-term cost of what alcohol use and alcohol-related harms cost our community. Awareness in general, one a place that alcohol has been very good about uh, awareness of, of secondhand harms is in drinking and driving. But by and large, the other alcohol-related harms are, very, are much less well-known. And that's a problem for the alcohol industry. If we look to examples for tobacco control, it's hard to find anybody who will try to argue that tobacco use is not harmful. But we have a lot of, oh, maybe there's health benefits to alcohol. There's mixed research and mixed messages on that. Um, there's a lot of things that people don't think about beyond drinking and driving, like violence, injury prevention, um, academic performance, unplanned pregnancies. So we have a lot of work to do to remind people of some of the connections that alcohol use um, has to harms in our communities. Information and data was another challenge, especially for communities at the local level, to actually have good, sound, reliable, relevant, recent data on what's actually happening in their community. And for a small, a small city or a small coalition or community group, 
to know how to get that information, where to get that information, to know the credibility of the information. I've seen countless examples of somebody trying to work with some survey data at the community level. And then there'll be somebody who starts to ask questions about that and they're not prepared to answer it. And um, so how do we help people develop some of that, both credible information and the knowledge of how to use it? And then last, capacity and training. A lot of our staff people that are working as public health practitioners have to wear many, many hats and they may not have adequate training or access to tools and training in a lot of the different alcohol policy areas. So what makes sound policy? What's good community mobilization skills? How do you go about that? How does the policy process work? All of those things are areas that a lot of our public health practitioners could use more support in. So we came up with a few suggestions um, that might counter these challenges. Um, so number one, providing evidence of the harms related to alcohol use, to overconsumption, um, getting that word out there more, helping people shape those messages, conducting needs assessments and pilot studies to identify local problems. So how is that affecting your community? What might be an issue in one community with a college campus and related problems might be very different from another community that has, that's primarily um, a younger families community. So how do we, how do we help groups find um, local data and, and things related to local problems? Um, we need to have funding for training and capacity building to support groups and people in this and uh, develop their skills and uh, to identify allies that can, can get on board. Um, Alcohol-related alcohol problems can impa impact us very broadly in the community, um, but sometimes people don't see their self-interest. For instance, um, maybe, you have, uh, maybe you're a, a young family with young children, and you might say, well, teen drinking, what does that have, you know, that, that, I don't have to worry about that for like eight, ten years yet. But maybe there's loud parties in the neighborhood, or maybe the park in your neighborhood is kind of uncomfortable because there's waste and debris from underage drinking parties. Um, so, so look for people that might not be traditional allies, but that would, can become partners as we start to identify and make those connections. Um, ensure that public health leadership is at the table and has a voice in decision making. That's very important. Um, the discussion in the previous session about how some of the marijuana initiatives have been passed and oftentimes nobody from the regulatory or public health agencies was even involved at all in the discussion until it was actually you know, enacted into law. Um, so we have to really make sure that people are there up front early on in these conversations. Media advocacy to increase awareness of the issues. And engaging voices of people who've been victims or who are in recovery, they can be very strong and uh, undertake a comprehensive approach. So you're looking at it from multiple angles. Now, as I mentioned when I started, 58% of the papers we looked at identified at some level a challenge. Most didn't go into much depth on that, but 42% didn't address challenges at all. They just talked about their program. Um, so part of that we would guess is because their purpose wasn't so much to look at implementation as to look at the policy under consideration. So that wasn't part of their examination. But, but that leads to one of the things that we see as a challenge is that we need to do more examination of what's going on in the implementation process so that we can take this valuable and useful research and really make it fit for our communities. So in inclusion, I'd just like to say that um, despite finding a number of challenges, we did see that there isn't sufficient examination of, of what those challenges may be or how to address them. And since we've got a lot of good examples of best practices, model programs, evidence of things that work in a research setting, we'd really like to see more emphasis put on future research to look at how do we implement these policies suggest successfully? What does it take to support community practitioners at the public health department level to be able to do this in a setting where they're not part of a well-funded research project? So thank you. Thank you. So hi everybody, my name is Heather Hageman and um, and I am the director of um, Beloved Yoga's uh, Trauma and Recovery Program. And um, so I just want to just say, why is yoga here today? That would be a good question. <laughs> uh, 
Um, this is uh, very um, near and dear to my heart, addictions. I've been in the addictions field for uh, 17 years, and my journey began with my own addiction, and I say that proudly because I have 17 years of sobriety, and so I like to um, put that out there because if we're going to bust the stigma, we need to talk about it, and I like that what you just said, that we need the voices of people that have been in the trenches with the addicts, and that has been me. And um, in my own journey, I am very blessed that early on I found yoga, and I also found uh, psychotherapists that uh, understood trauma. And that is one of the things that um, we look at uh, very deeply is, is that uh, addictions is, in our opinion, uh, dysregul dysregulated trauma in the body, and that um, people are choosing uh, addic addictions as medicine to help balance the dysregulated dysreg symptoms of trauma. Uh, there, if you, um, I as I, in my own journey, I experienced that, and, and so I uh, was told by many people in the program, because I went that route, uh, you really need to do yoga, and you better get there fast. And I didn't know what really what that meant, but um, I did follow suggestion, and that's how I began my yoga journey. But what I found out in the yoga journey is that there are yogas that are not quite the right yoga, for people that have very dysregulated systems. And so um, a lot of what we have created now, and we'll be talking about that, Miriam will be going into this, is we are um, trying to address this uh, earlier on, in, uh, and, and we're trying to work with uh, teens, uh, we would, uh, middle school particularly, and uh, we created an ultimate teen yoga um, toolkit. And um, she'll be giving more details about that, but we, what I have seen in my own journey and working one-on-one, -on -one, and I have worked in treatment centers, and I am also right now um, getting my uh, counseling, uh, my substance abuse counseling um, certification. I am co-facilitating groups with psycho, uh, psychotherapists, particularly right now, and we are also, um, we've been for the past uh, five years working with clients, and it's been a wonderful pairing of, of having the person work on the trauma in the mind, and then to be able to go right next door to me and to work with the body because oftentimes people don't want to touch the traumas because they can't they can't regulate from it and you'll you'll talk people talk a lot about walking out of a therapy session not being able to move and and so I'm able to help them breathe and ground and come to present moment and be safe so this collaboration is very cool and, and we're seeing more and more of this more and more psychotherapists are coming to our trauma informed training that we have to learn to how to give skills of regulation, not only to their therapists, but to themselves, um, not only to their clients, but to themselves, because vicarious traumatization is also happening with a lot of, of the people who are working with addictions. So um, anyway, the main thing is, is how do we, uh, so that the, the, there's a lot of studies that, are co that have come out, and what I see common, and just me f looking at people reporting to me, um, is that everyone started using at a very early age. It's always around between 13 and 15 years old. And um, we, there's a lot of studies that substantiate that and they're looking at this. But what we are now knowing, like I said earlier, is that the tr we need to have a trauma-informed yoga. And this came out from Bessel van der Kolk and David Emerson back in the um, uh, 2011 time period where they started to look at how do we make yoga safe for people that have trauma. And a lot of what happens in the yoga field has been the lack of choice and cueing can be triggering just the way the room is set. And the little thing I think we bring to the table is we need to educate our young about their bodies about their minds and their brains and their nervous systems. We also need to create um, uh, groups where there is this, and you know, and, and, I, and I can't really go into this, but the polyvagal theory is a big, huge um, uh, look at creating um, safety in groups. And so this is how we got our group started, the teen, um, the teen group, is that we wanted to create a place where they can learn about themselves, they could have connection with each other, because that keeps people in the calming system, the parasympathetic system, is which, which is what yoga has always been for thousands of years, a therapeutic parasympathetic body modality. And so um, this is what we're doing, is educating, teaching them how to self-regulate so that they can maybe make that choice when, it, when drugs or alcohol or food, whatever it is, is coming at them to make them feel better, that they have a way to maybe not reach out, but to go in to self-regulate. 
And so with that, I will hand that over to my colleague. Thank you. Uh, Heather and I are two of the first uh, groups of yoga therapists in the state of Virginia. It's a new field that's emerging, and it's really important that you all start to differentiate between yoga and yoga therapy because it will help serve what you're all interested in here, which is addiction, recovery, and serving the community with intelligent public health policies and to work in partnerships with the medical field, with psychotherapy. It is yoga therapy that needs to be the partner. The yoga as a generalization will not be effective as we have hit our obstacles with that. So we looked at addictions from a place of source. 80 to 90 percent of addictions, as Heather stated, begins in the teenage years. So we look to serving that part of our community. This year, after investigating family life, uh, educational programs in Fairfax County public school system, after looking at what are the teens exposed to as far as education that can help be preventative for them so they don't reach for substance abuse, uh, su substances, is we look that they never learn, and I can say this because we, I mean, yesterday I did a full review of the FLE programs, objectives of Fairfax County, they never learn about their body their breath, how to utilize it for self-regulation. And in our pilot study, we also looked at the teen brain. The teen brain is also wired to be a, you know, pain pleasure, that's it. Decision making starts to come into play a little later on. So you can't blame why they're doing that because they're trying to regulate themselves. Yet, teens are very adaptable and very intelligent, these young people, and they wanna get the tools. So we created a pilot study with the Fairfax County Teen Center. They bust their kids in and we asked them, do you want us to come to the teen center or do you wanna come to us? They said it's gonna be much more effective and the, a lot of the children in the, the young people in the teen center are low income, comes from very complex uh, trauma, family, lifestyles. They said it's gonna be much better if we can bring them there because of the polyvagal theory, understanding environment, understanding how important it is to have spaces <laughs> that also feel like healing centers <laughs> is really es essential. So brought them over and we didn't do, we, we just couldn't gather enough of the data that we wanted to. Fairfax County also did not have the appropriate budget to pay for them to be bussed over. So we created a second pilot study, which we just completed. And this one was with 11 teens in our area, Fairfax County, which is in Northern Virginia. And they came, mostly their parents signed them up, and we put them through a four-week session. They learned about their body, they learned about their breath, they learned about their mind, and they learned about their whole being. We did self-reporting assessments at the beginning of the four weeks and at the end of the four weeks. And I would will be happy to email you the paper and just come up to us at the end and we'll email that to you directly so you can see the data. The biggest impact that we see, and we want to continue this, we do need funding. This is one of the things that to shift, you know, policy, we need to get more data so it's evidence-based. But the number one shift we saw is at the beginning of the report, the individuals almost 90% did not, they were not able to assess sensations in their body. They never checked in with themselves. At the end of four weeks, they were checking in with themselves. About 70, 80% increase of that. And that is a huge deal. That means that they will check in with themselves at the moments of stress to learn how to regulate, to learn one, how they feel, awareness. Two, to assess the tools that they have been given. Three, to activate them. This is very significant when we're seeing that one, the layer of awareness is beginning. That next is learning the methodology and having the tools um, for implementation. And we will continue to do these studies. We met with Supervisor Hudgens yesterday. We are still actively seeking partnership. But we do our whole kind of abstract and our premise is that we need to shift the education of middle school. That is the, the biggest target of teens. High school becomes a little bit 
harder, but possible, to ninth grade. After that, it's, it's much harder. But seventh to ninth grade is the place where we feel if we can start to have these educational programs on a state and county level, it will start to do what the original, the title of this entire symposium is, eradicate addictions. And that's where we feel it needs to begin with. Thank you. Um, just uh, following up with the last speakers, you know, um, as my name is Ignatius Sijere, uh, born in Nigeria, educated in Nigeria, educated in the United Kingdom, taught in the United Kingdom for some years, then moved down to the United States. No, nothing special, just moving around. Um, and also, I teach at Syracuse University. Um, I also have a private practice with uh, a lot of clinical psychologists. I, I'm a clinical psychologist myself. Um, and we use most times yoga. And we have specialists, someone trained in yoga in our private practice. And every semester I teach addiction related classes, almost at least uh, two of them every semester, then I branch into psychology proper. Um, in each of the classes I teach, which is very big class, I bring in yoga specialists, trained, licensed. They come in there, they take about three or four of my classes. I mean, teach the students and practice with them. Why? Because of what you guys mentioned. So important that, you know, our adolescents, we, they need self-regulation. It's okay to, you know, to say, hey, stop using drugs. You know, don't use drugs. Say yes or no, but, you know, it is always important for our adolescents to, you know, develop that skill of self-regulation. Very, very essential. And family members need to know that, you know. Um, let's, let me give you a kind of fact. This year, from the National Survey of Adolescents and other studies, indicated that one in four children and adolescents in the United States experiences at least one potential traumatic event before the age of 16. Imagine that. And then they went further to say, in America, American adolescents between the ages of 12 and 17 engages in abuse substance issues. Lego or illegal? So we have a big problem in our hands. You know? Whether as intellectuals, researchers, which I do with Syracuse University, I also teach, whether as a practitioner with my private practice, we have a very big problem in our hands. And I, I appreciate, you know, the research you guys are doing and coming up and teaching people that, you know, it, it, it's not sufficient enough to tell this population to only stop using without considering that a lot of them have gone through a lot. And because sometimes when we mention trauma, we only look at certain aspects of it. There are other aspects that we can kind of overlook, which I'm not gonna talk about. So I just wanna kind of bring, you know, branch it into that yoga system that is very, very important in addiction treatment, prevention, and also addiction, you know, teaching. So, um, w here what I'm trying to look at is to, emphasize the brain structure of, uh, uh, of this particular population. And I'm going with United Nations understanding of the young ones are the, what they call adolescents. So the brain structure is such that it's not inferior, but it's immature that it is going the process of development and that we need to pay very close attention to. Because sometimes, you know, uh, both policymakers, psychologists, and social workers and scientists, you know, w you know, we have come to see very much concern when it comes to addiction among this population. The epidemics of opioids and epidemics of other substances that are really not, you know, being researched today, coming up gradually, step by step, and eating up this particular population. And it's, it's something that we really need to pay attention to and find a way of trying to get them in tune with how to manage substances. Now, when you guys were talking about self-regulation, it's also, 
you know, use more of energy from the brain, which is very, very essential. And, and, and for us to know this particular population, you know, their brain structure is very unique and very different from that of adults. And if we pay attention to their brain development, especially the frontal cortex and the area that use, we call the executive brain, or the area I normally call you know, the, the, the stop system, or which is more of, you know, you know, if you are driving a new car and you are enjoying the smell of the car and the road is good, you, you, you want to kind of keep on going, and there's a part of your brain will be say, hey, apply your brake. So the part of the brain called the stop system is, is something that is an ongoing development when it comes to this population. And, and, and especially the frontal cortex, which engages in terms of impulse control, euphoric control. We're not saying eradicate those things. They, they, are, there. they are part of the human existence. You, you, you want to eat, right? <laughs> you want to feel hungry. You, you want to feel that you need something to sustain yourself. But we need something to control that. And that's the area of the frontal cortex and the stop system or the civilized brain, if you want to use some concepts. And these sections of the brain are still uh, developing with this population. And so that's something that we need to pay attention to when we are developing either prevention or treatment programs for this particular population. And such characteristics, if we are looking at the undeveloping process of this population, put them at a very high risk level of picking up, of continuing to pick up, of struggling to stop. When people tell you that they are struggling to stop, it's not that they want to destroy themselves. It's not, the research have not shown that. It's not that they, they, they don't feel the impact of the use. It, it's very, very hard. And when someone remains sober for one day in my practice, a patient comes in, I am sober for today. It's a good job. Because it's not easy. And so for this population, you know, it's, 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 it puts them at a very high risk because of their uh, brain structure. But however, we're not ignoring the fact that, I think you guys brought that up, we're not ignoring the fact that they have high level of you know, flexibility in their brain. They can, they can do better. They only need some support and help to be able to deal with substance abuse issues in our country, in our nation, and in the global concept. Uh, it's, it's very, very important when we are looking at substance abuse issues among this population, you know, across the nation and the, the continent, it, it, the data is very, very overwhelming. If you look at the United Nations, the data they have, you look at the nation, the uh, North American content, it's also very high. And so the, the, the problem is that we have to emphasize some of the factors that tend to contribute towards the vulnerability of these patients, of this population, besides the brain structure. You, you look at schools, you look at families, you look at peers, you look at socioeconomic, so physical environment levels. All these things tend to play, which we in IPT, which is interpersonal psychotherapy, we look, that's what we target when we use IPT. We target this environment because these variables are things that might trigger an individual to continue to use, struggle to stop to use, and as well as, you know, continuing the maintenance level of sobriety. And, you know, there is this urgency for consistency and overpowering to continue to use and struggle inability to stop it. This is, this is the hardest part of recovery at my patients, especially this population, because that's the population I treat. Very challenging, but you know, they, they, they can be very helpful in trying to you know, be in recovery and with a recovery environment. And that's why we, we, we decided to use CBT and IPT, especially in, in my private practice. In conjunction with specialists um, in yoga and mindfulness and also uh, family-related issues. 
And here, what I'm trying to look at is uh, look at you know timely psychotherapy modalities, precisely CBT and IPT. I'm not going to go into definitions of uh, those things. Precisely, CBT is you know targeting some of, of the dysfunctional cognitive thought processes in uh, this population, associated sometimes with trauma. And and we we are trying to figure out how we can help them to correct, to adjust this dysfunctional and um, inaccurate use of some of these thought processes. Whereas in IPT, what we are looking at is some of the interpersonal relationships of the individual with the population, individual with the environment. And if we're able to help them to adjust to their developmental program, to their developmental stages in relation to their, that would be very helpful, you know, to, to get them treated and sustain them in recovery. Um, the effectiveness of cognitive behavioral therapy has been researched and has been stated. That is very clear, especially with this population. It helps them in cognitive restructuring, cognitive readjustments, and putting them back into having to decide, have very high level of refusal skills. But very limited research has been done in the when it comes to interpersonal relationship or interpersonal um, psychotherapy. But we are ongoing trying to figure out how to help them with this part of uh, psychotherapy. But very limited research, as I said, earlier on, and we are, getting, we are getting there. The goal of both time-limited psychotherapy is to help the, 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 one of the major goals is to help this population to learn how to refuse to learn how to interact, to learn how to associate themselves with the environment in a way that is healthy for them without using substances. When to use it? For us in psychotherapeutic practice, there's really no time, you know, you can say nowhere, no, no specific variable you can say, well, you have to pay attention to one particular variable. However, we come up with the certain variables Look at the individual's background, look at the drug use, presence of uh, dual diagnosis, whether a person has mental health or other substance use issues, and all these variables, you look at them, that will help you to determine if and when you can use IPT or CBT psychotherapy approach in conjunction with, of course, yoga and mindfulness. So the point here I'm trying to emphasize is that CBT has been very, very effective in treating this population. IPT has been very effective, but with limited you know, research and data to deal with that. And I am hoping that you know, with time, we can combine both CBT and IPT to help this particular population in dealing with issues related to substance abuse and other addiction processing formats. Thank you.